Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a very different week of the War Report, because this is our only episode this week, whereas last week we put out about four, three or four, I believe. There was a lot happening, I'll admit that, but now that the dust is starting to settle relatively, the events in Eastern Europe, as we'll call them, in order to not gain the ire of YouTube, at least this early on into the broadcast, have set in. They haven't calmed down by any means, but They've set into the routine, so to speak. We're just over a couple weeks into the actual conflict ex- itself. And, as always, we're not going to get too much into the nitty-gritty. We'll talk about the larger implications of the conflict and give a broad overview of the conflict. But we have some arguably much more pertinent news about the global economy, inflation, energy rates, and even food prices, and a possible intent, impending economic crisis on a global scale, not seen since at least 2008 and possibly even worse. Maybe it'll get to Great Depression levels. Again, I'm an economics dropout, so I only know so much about economics. Trust me, it's all witchcraft from my very limited experience. But with that being said, we can get right into it. So the back and forth has continued in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine with, of course, Russian advancements, Ukrainian propaganda about how they're at the gate, uh, gates of Moscow. Uh, then it just, you mean Kiev? N- no, I- I'm saying the Ukrainians are the propaganda that oh. they are. <laughs> they they have launched a counter invasion. That's that's oh, what I'm getting. Oh, at. I heard about that. Um, yes, and that that sort of uh, interesting meta narrative that they're on the brink of victory. They just need to trust the plan. But with that being said, of course, there's been rounds of peace talks all of which would seem to be non-fruitful, to say the least, if not outright detrimental, to be a bit critical of it, of just the situation in general, not necessarily either side, even though I believe you all know our biases very well at this point, so it's not even worth saying. But there was a set of conditions laid down by the Russians, which included uh, commitment to neutrality, recognition of Crimea and Donbass as um, respectively part of Russia and sovereign states, and just a list of pretty much reiterating Minsk II in, as forms of a peace agreement, trying to get them to submit to that. And that was one of the speculations we had when this first broke out, that maybe their ultimate goal going into this is just to force an enforcement of Minsk II. Now, I think, I know it's not that far in it, we're only, again, just shy of two weeks, just over two weeks, just look. Like, let me take a look at the calendar. Time sort of blends together. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, just, just over two weeks of, of the conflict. It looks like with how deep they in, are in now, they're probably going to demand greater concessions come negotiations, but that seems to be their baseline. But we can only say so much with it being so early on with how rapidly the situation changes. Now, in terms of what's on the ground, there hasn't been, of course, any news that seems major enough to say that uh, there was a, a great breakthrough by Russian forces or the Ukrainians staved off some Russian advance. It just seems to be progressing as normally. And as usual, the propaganda war seems to be the main story yet again because a lot of Western media, in fact, almost all Western media, with the exception of Tucker Carlson, which there's always been debates about what is the role of Tucker? Is he controlled op? Is he just somebody gone rogue? And I, I've found myself on both sides of that argument throughout various times, but I, I honestly don't know what to make of his current rhetoric beyond that. It's useful. Yeah. It is very useful uh, to us and people like us. So I'm going to let him continue what he's doing. Not that I, of course, have any influence to stop him or anything, but again, I'm not going to dedicate any energy to uh, questioning the means and motives and just accept what we're being given for the time being because beggars cannot be choosers, especially in cases like this. But going back to that, I do want to get into the debacle with Poland and the shipment of fighters and <laughs> what a what a mess that was and the response to the European Union, NATO, and the Pentagon respectively. Of course, the discussion of a fly zone or even a fly zone over part of the country has been pardon the pun, shot down almost immediately, even by more uh, 
countries that you expect to be more hawkish, such as, say, Lithuania or a Poland or some of these other Eastern European states which have very strong anti-Russia posture, even they aren't willing to go that far, which maybe I am stretching out a bit here, but it seems like when it comes to that, when it comes to rubber hitting the road, pen being put to paper, that a lot of these countries are willing to talk the anti-Russia talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, they are much more hesitant to, because the real implications of what something like that would mean. And I think the example out of Poland is the most pertinent. Where you had NATO putting extreme pressure on Poland to ship these fighter jets to Ukraine, where you had the Pentagon come out and say, you are putting the entirety of NATO at risk by taking a move like this because of Russia's statements. And then the European Union comes in, and of course sanctions were levied against Hungary and Poland by the European Union for other reasons, again for the ongoing reasons, but they also did cite in terms of their contention with Hungary and Poland lately, especially with Poland, is that they were taking more risk than necessary when it came to the response to the Ukrainian conflict. So, as many opinions that we may have come off as criticizing Poland, which I think that's fair to say that we have criticized Poland plenty for their, um, let's just say, dubious decisions in terms of this entire uh, global struggle over the past, say, four years since we've been doing the show. But with that being said, you do have to at least sympathize with them in this situation where they do recognize that they are a secondary, if not tertiary, power, that many of their decisions are dictated on high, or at least influenced on high, from outside powers, that particularly being Brussels and Washington. And then when you have this mix of just messages, whether you have an obligation to send these, you have an obligation not to send these, you're risking NATO membership, you're risking the safety of the entire world, you're risking World War Three. You do have to sympathize even with the Polish leadership, despite all their misgivings, despite all their faults, despite all their even previous mistakes, the fact that they've been put in such an incoherent position. And I do think it goes back to something we've touched on for several years now, particularly with the Trump administration, but you could say just as much with the Biden administration, and just the apparatus of the American empire over the past several years now, that it is a fundamentally incoherent and, dare I even say, schizophrenic global policy where... They have no one-cent narrative. It's constantly shifting. You had Biden coming out yeah. today, putting out a statement on Twitter, having his people put out a statement on Twitter that we're not going to intervene directly in Ukraine. We're going to galvanize NATO to protect them against the Russian threat. But intervening in, intervening in Ukraine would certainly lead to another world war, which the words of at least Biden's official people. Now, again, I doubt he dictates his own tre- tweets. I could see Trump doing that. But point being is... A Biden-approved message was put out saying that we have no intention to intervene directly within Ukraine, just protect the territorial sovereignty of NATO states, which has been the line all along, but just further reiterating that. But again, while those are the words, the actions seem to be all over the place, whereas they seem to want to prod Ukraine into further conflict, it seems that we want to offer military aid to further provoke the war and further provoke Russian action, and also encourage other European and NATO states do the same. So once again, it gets down to this fundamentally incoherent policy where you can tell there's probably a very fierce disagreement among the rulers of the empire, even down to the mid-level bureaucratic ranks on how to actually respond to this. You probably do have a very hawkish wing in the deep state, so to speak, and a more measured wing in the deep state. And they seem to be butting heads right now except that's leaking to the public because of the size and scale of this current crisis. Well, I mean, America has um, two reasons uh, why prolonging the war in Ukraine benefits them. And the first reason is that, uh, first of all, it will, you know, kill more Russians. Uh, It will kill also Ukrainians, but Ukrainians aren't really important to them. Um, otherwise, they would have er- er- eradicated the child sex trade that um, is the number one in uh, all of Europe. Well, I, I, we've been saying for the past eight, well, the past four years, but in terms of the past eight years of the conflict, that these people, especially the more nationalistic Ukrainians, you know, as much as they do purport to care about their nation, and as much as they do want to take up arms to defend it against any perceived aggression, they're being led into a meat grind by people like the current Ukrainian government. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these groups, quite honestly, uh, 
they're desperate for, for money. So they'll take money from anybody when their objectives align with people who have money. I mean, you know, rebel paramilitary groups have a long history of doing uh, drug trade, sex trade, anything to uh, counterban, anything to uh, to raise the money because they don't have <laughs> the means, right? Uh, so they have to be, they, they will accept being hired thugs, right? Um, but the other, uh, so one reason it hurts Russia, uh, economically as well as uh, militarily, uh, that has an effect on the morale the longer this war drags on. Uh, but the other um, reason that they, that they want this is it keeps the likelihood of the sanctions being permanent. However, there's a catch-22 to that, and that is uh, Germany has already started complaining, and it's not a sure bet that um, you know Europe will be able to handle the kind of discontent that will arise if this drags on, let's say, for another six months. Um, then you you will see major food prices, particularly in wheat products, and it will completely destabilize the Middle East again, like it did in 2011. And, you're, and Europe is going to experience massive migration, even worse than in 2015. T Turkey will not be able to handle it. And I think the Russians are betting on that. Um, the, you know, um, Russia, I think, in order to disguise you know, an invasion, uh, had to keep its foreign assets, uh, which it had many, but it reduced, I think the Kremlin had something like $635 billion in, in assets and 300 of, 300 of that has been seized. So this is going to make life for the average Russian a lot more, a lot more difficult. I still believe that they can weather it better. And it all depends on where other countries align. China, for sure, is going to align. Um, you know, an example is uh, BP, which has something like 18 or 19 percent share, and Gazprom is going to sell off its share. So it's going to, of course, China is going to buy it for next to nothing. And uh, so, long term, you know. Uh, it will be China who will benefit the most. America, maybe, maybe not, but Russia, Europe, and Ukraine will suffer the most uh, because Certainly. of this. Certainly. And getting into the question of the, the economy in Russia and how much they can weather, I think a lot of people need to put this in perspective that Iran, a much smaller and much poorer nation, has weathered arguably yeah. even much harsher sanctions for the past 40 years since the rise of the Islamic Republic, and they are still standing. This is even before they had a reconciliation with Russia and China, that they managed to survive, and the regime managed to survive in Iran for as long as it did. So we have no conceivable reason to believe unless there's some masterful coup of the oligarchs against Putin, which I don't see happening. Again, I could no, be proven wrong, but either. I don't see it happening. Russia isn't is going to follow the same path as the Iranians in that, and they're going to fare much better. Of course, you have the shutdown of more corporate chains in Russia, and it seems like I'm sure there's ones that actually do hit it hard, but it seems like a lot of these are superficial, like fast food chains shutting down and entertainment franchises shutting down, things that really won't impact the quality of life in any meaningful sense and may actually be better in the long run. One of the ones I found particularly humorous was uh, Pizza Hut, which I suppose solidifies Gorbachev's legacy of failure. I mean, <laughs> for those of you unfamiliar, just look up the Gorbachev Pizza Hut commercial. That was uh, not a parody, not yeah. a spoof. It was real. It was in 1990 on the deathbed of the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev did a commercial for Pizza Hut. And now they have shut down, at least temporarily, in Russia. And, the and other McDonald's. News, uh, yes, so the Golden Arches theory has been disproven because McDonald's suspended yeah. operations in both Russia and Ukraine. So it looks like the end of historyists win again 
It, it, at least they'll take that as a victory, I suppose, because they need anything they can get at this point. But with that being said, you also had Putin come out over the course of this past week and say he wants to start nationalizing assets within Russia. Now, on the surface, that could have been anything, but you look further into it, at least my interpretation, correct me if I'm wrong, he wants to nationalize a lot of foreign-owned assets and sell them to domestic owners is what I see because yep. uh, when, when it comes to this debate, uh, again, a lot of uh, people knee-jerked like, uh, I guess Putin really still is a communist. Again, like it's just like the, the boomer takes <laughs> to see like on Twitter and that kind of stuff. But uh, one, one thing I will say, again, if there's one thing I think everyone except the most rabid of neoliberals can agree on is that Vladimir Putin is a pragmatist and that he won't forsake – Really, any degree of stability in terms of any greater ideological goal, he'll make compromises. And so, in, in a lot of cases, I would say even to the detriment, not willing to take those risks, and he is the stability candidate. And again, maybe that's to the detriment of himself and even the Russian nation at times. But what it looked like is that Russia wants to, again, become more autarkic on top of the pressure of the sanctions. Now, the sanctions for the past eight years, and especially over the past two weeks, have forced them to up that ante far more than they ever have, but it looks like they want to take these proactive steps and rather than losing these foreign assets operating within Russia, seize them and put them in the hands of Russians. Now, I'm sure people would say political allies, whatever. It's like, that's how politics works. I mean, every political system is a spoil system. We've been over this. And yeah. I, I can't speak. I'm not a Russian. Again, I suppose we'll have to have Vyal Varangian back on back when he's uh, done leading his brigades to the, to the, through the fields of eastern Ukraine, I suppose. Uh, we'll get him back on for his victory <laughs> celebration. Uh, but, yeah, uh, w- with that being said, I, I'd have to ask an actual Russian or actual Russians what the situation really looks like on the ground in order to actually get a um, variable picture. I know you've been there a few times, so you have – bit more of an insight than I do, but point being is most people will accept some degree of corruptions in a spoil system if it works, because that is the nature of governance, that is the nature of politics, Mm -hmm. it inherently carries reward, and we used to understand that. Now, that did have its flaws, that did lead to abuses of power, as every system is abuses of power, but it was generally understood up until the past, I would say, 70 years, that with power comes privilege, explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, a lot of commodities, but I think maybe flying under the radar are two very highly important commodities, maybe the most important that Russia has up its sleeve, and that's neon and palladium, because they are the, Russia and Ukraine are the only producers of neon and palladium, and that is what you need to create um, chips, computer chips. So before they go to, before Taiwan makes them, well, the source material has to come from there. And one of the reasons why, um, you know, it was important for the Americans to take over Ukraine was to steal that from them. And, you know, I mean, it would still be under Ukraine, but Ukraine would be separated from Russia, uh, let's say, culturally, economically, morally, right? Uh, But that's, I think, that's a card that I think if things get really bad, I I do think Putin will use that. Uh, And it's going to have tremendous repercussions because essentially what that will do is potentially it can make China like, like it can inc- China wouldn't have to invade Taiwan to take over the chip manufacturing plants there. It has its own. It is slowly refining them, but just by scarcity, Russia could make China the king of chip makers, and that would completely rebalance everything. And once again, that's getting back to the relationship between Russia and China. It's not as lopsided as I think a lot of people, even on our side, would see it as. Because yeah. people see China's GDP figures, and whether those are real, whether those books are cooked, it doesn't matter. People, I think, can generally accept that China, when it comes to economic power, Purchasing power of Russia. an individual, yeah, it's um, very high. But when it comes to strategic relationships, I'm not saying it's completely egalitarian, I'm not saying it's completely equal, 
But Russia has much more leverage over China than I think a lot of people would realize. And you were getting into the resource wars. Something I would recommend, I'll actually put a link down to this, uh, to an audio narrated version, is the Catholic bishop, uh, I think it's uh, Vigano, had a very sober uh, assessment of the entire situation. It's about an hour long to listen through, but he put out this entire uh, statement that I think... Um, hits all the bases in the, in the right place, whether you're Catholic or not, because, I mean, neither of us are, but, I mean, I wholeheartedly in, endorse yeah. pretty much everything he said, and I, again, I'll put the link down in the description if you would like to give that a listen, because I would certainly recommend it, but uh, just to give a, a brief summary, he's saying that a lot of this is being set the stage, and arguably even Russia is being lured into a trap in order to solidify what he would have called the New World Order, that's one name for it, whether you want to call that the, the GIE, GAE, the American Empire, neoliberalism, any of these various names that we call this um, overarching hegemony that rules over all of us, uh, that it is giving a lot of the justification and that they fomented this conflict because it lets them make a lot of the moves that they would want to, such as further control of the media, further control of the economy, tied it back into the convid narrative with the economic shutdowns and the health restrictions, and uh, once again, I, I can't do it justice in just these couple minutes here, so I would definitely recommend either reading that or listening to that. Uh, but moving on right. from that... And you can, look at, you can look at this whole situation as something that America did want. America did want Russia to go to war in Ukraine. America did want that, because um, ultimately what America wants to shut down uh, is the relationship, the growing relationship that was developing between Europe and Russia, and also the possibility of stopping Russia from being able to trade with anybody but China, right? And in China's, you know, what China does with that, I don't know. But at the moment, agreements have already been made with India uh, to trade rupee for ruble. Massive Pakistan, purchasing of gold just over the past Turkey, several years, um, just to add Right, that. and now Argentina and Brazil also uh, are going along. I think Mexico's, uh, I'm, uh, people can correct us in, in the chat if Mexico has changed its mind or not. But uh, ultimately, that's what they want to do, right? That's, that's the goal is to, now I think Putin also knew by 2030, they, you know, Europe was supposed to not be dependent on any energy from Russia anyways, right? So you could say that he preempted what was happening. Anyhow, America, of course, goaded uh, Zelensky to say all kinds of things, particularly when he met with pa- uh, Kamala Harris. And, you know, she said that uh, we look forward to you joining NATO. You know, that was a red line. And you know, there's other things. There's other things like um, the Ukrainian company that worked with the Russians in Chernobyl, for instance. They cut ties completely by 2021. And now the companies that have stakes in that company are all tied to the U.S. So, I mean, I think the idea of uh, Ukraine developing its own nuclear missiles is fanciful when, in fact, um it would be just easier for America to just install the missiles themselves. Yeah, similar to what they already do with Japan and Korea and various other sites as well. Yeah. But with that being said, it, it does get into that interesting conversation about the Russian-Chinese relationship as well, because you even had murmurs from the regime in America that they were considering sanctions on China due to its economic cooperation with Russia. Now, keep in mind how... Despite the trade yeah. war, despite everything that happened under Trump, that the U.S. and China are still very economically intertwined, and it does lead some people to believe, I would say, with a, uh, with good reason to say that the current regime is trying to economically cripple the, the home base, the heartland of the United States, in order to usher in the so-called Great Reset, or the plan by the econo- World Economic Forum, or just any of these various plans to really solidify the regime in a time of crisis, which it it is a very interesting situation where you do have these machinations, you do have them making these moves towards, again, the system that 
they might want under the under what has come to be known as the Great Reset, while their power is also the most fragile it has ever been. Perhaps those two things are related. Perhaps they're accelerating their plans because of that. But as we were discussing with Russia's actions in Ukraine, I believe for the American Empire, for the current global hegemony, that it is an, a now or never moment for them as well. And that for all yeah. the major players involved, whether that be the American Empire, whether that be Europe as extension of the American Empire, Russia, China, even some of these upstart powers, say India, I think it's a global now or never moment for all of them to make their moves to set the course for the rest of the 21st century. Right, exactly. So um, it is it is a it is a do or die for for many uh, civilizations and countries right now. Uh, what happens this year, I think, is going to set the pace for at least the next fifty years. And, yeah, this, um, this is this is one of those pivotal years, and I've said perhaps a, a bit exaggeratingly in the past that. We're seeing some of the greatest geopolitical machinations since 1914-1919 era with World War One and the post-war era, or even, say, World War II and the post-war era with that. And I would actually, in a much less flippant manner, I'd say in a much more concrete manner, that we are seeing changes. We are seeing the rise of a new world order, for lack of a better term. Now, what what will that resemble? Will that be what the people at the World Economic Forum wants? Will it be a more classical definition with, say, a return of multiple great powers all competing with each other, but also keeping each other on check on the world stage to, say, say the 18th, 19th, and up until the 20th century were? Will it be another bipolar world, such as it was under America and the Soviet Union, perhaps America-led sphere and a Chinese-led sphere? Only time will tell, but I do think we are on the precipice from divorcing the phrase from its connotation of, quite literally, a new world order. Things will be restructured. The global hegemony of the American empire, I think, at this point, is effectively gone. We discussed with Saudi Arabia and their machinations with the U.S. dollar last week and effectively putting an end to the petrodollar. And on top of that, you have several countries, mentioned this in passing, Hungary, some of these smaller countries, but now even up to Russia, have suspended exports of raw resources at least up until the end of 2022. And they said yeah. they'll readdress that in January 2023, which, who knows what the global situation will look like by now. We might all uh, be in, uh, let's just say, uh, vac- uh, FEMA vacation resorts, for a YouTube-friendly term. Uh, but with that being said, we may even be on this platform. I'll also put a link down to our BitChute channel if you guys want to have other places to find us. If you want to, uh, you know, watch it on a different platform at principle or if worse comes to worse, you can find us elsewhere as well. But with that being said, moving on to the restructuring of the global order, I think it's time to give energy prices the, uh, the, the proper attention that they deserve as well yeah. as the just economic impact. So, over the course of the past week, domestic gas prices in the United States jumped, I believe, about 50 to 60 cents, depending on where you were, but I believe the national average was about 53, 55 cents nationally gas prices were up. And where I live, I've personally seen that. They spiked overnight. Even the cheap gas station I like to go to was expensive, which really pains my heart, especially somebody who drives a lot. That really, uh, that really starts to burn a hole in your wallet. But there has been an interesting reaction. I'll get into the reaction before I get into some of the broader implications, just to get some of the narrative-driven stuff out of the way, where you have, of course, talking heads of the Biden administration, especially Psaki, as I like to call her, coming out and saying, oh, why don't you... And and, um, and Buttigieg also saying, well, you could just invest in an electric car if gas is too expensive. Uh, or maybe it's too expensive, you just need to get rid of your truck, or maybe and any of these other things, because we all know sedans run on sheer willpower, no you know, no gasoline <laughs> required. But also overlooking the issue of supply chains, that even if you are an urbanite, like many of these people are, who walks or takes public transportation or bikes everywhere, well, the shipping industry of the United States is still largely by semi-truck on the highways, those things yep. use diesel fuel. So cost in fuel prices, cost to transport actual goods 
increases costs across the board because you're increasing one of those very baseline things. Again, I think all economics is witchcraft, but this is one of the most basic concepts to understand that when price of one of the most baseline thing goes up, it pushes everything else up with it. And everything seems to be going up except wages, except salaries, except how much people are actually getting paid, which puts them in a hell of a situation. We barely recovered from 2008 and arguably didn't even in most of the country, and we're being pushed back down into yet another recession. They've been in denial about it, but we've effectively been in a recession since 2020, since the convict crisis, and with, of course, the inflation rates, the uh, printing of the dollar, and some statistics say that roughly 80% of American currency in circulation was minted in since 2020, which is a believable figure looking at the past, you know, two, two and a half years. I mean, there were signs on the horizon. We talked about some of these things back in 2019 that there were some dangerous waters ahead. Now, of course, there were some major accelerants, such as the convict crisis, and now more recently, this Ukraine crisis. But these were things that we were talking about. We probably expected from 2025 to 2030, so it looks like we've been pushed a few years ahead of schedule, because I would have said a lot of these things would have happened in the late 2020s. The fact that a lot of this is happening doesn't surprise me so much as that's happening so soon is where the surprise really gets me. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, like I said, uh, there's a preemption uh, going on right now. Um, because I think everybody started to see where uh, the road was going, what the initiatives were, and what, you know, the kind of world that uh, that was being built. And, um, you know, it, it, in, in a way, it preempts the, uh, the this kind of slow grinding um, effect on, um, on, on the countries that are going to be most affected. So, you know, if you don't act now, you're never going to be able to act uh, later because the vice is tightening. What a YouTube friendly I mean, way of putting that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, not, not, not in the words I'd have chosen instinctually, but I suppose for the sake of the platform, hey, it works. But <laughs> as you were discussing earlier, I believe wheat futures as of this week, one of the figures thrown around, they were up at least 30%, which again, that also leads to potential for a food crisis in places like the Middle East and Africa, some of these more poor blighted areas, and also some of these more conflict-prone areas, whether you want to go down to, you know, HBD reasons or economic reasons or post-colonialism, but point being, no matter what you attribute it to, when you make the conditions even worse, violence is more likely to break out. You brought up the Arab Spring. Now, a lot of that was manufactured. Uh, hell, perhaps they're trying another Arab Spring. Perhaps they're trying another crisis of that end. And the thought is that the major producer countries, such as the U.S., France, Argentina, Canada, even Russia and Ukraine, will weather this crisis. But, I mean, with the current Western regimes, what do you put it past them to... Maybe, okay, maybe they might overplay their hand, but I do think they're smart enough not to absolutely cause famine within their own country. But I could see them worsening economic conditions and worsening access to food for... A significant amount of the population lead to, uh, again, not not necessarily a, a complete starvation, but I could see them in some sort of moral or some sort of even more ulterior motive move, sending food aid to these more blighted areas of the world while there is a current economic and social crisis at home. I wouldn't put it past the government of the United States, France, Canada especially, or even somewhere like Argentina to make a move like that. And it wouldn't be the first time, I mean, just look at the American foreign aid budget, even after 2008, even after, again, the hollowing out of the American middle class for the past 30 years. So maybe they wouldn't be as brazen about it because they don't want food riots, but it's not inconceivable that they would, either for some rabid ideological motivation or some ulterior motive that supposedly keeps the regime stable, put the well-being of these poorer countries, these poorer foreign countries, over that of their core territories. And that is something 
I am coming to fear that, again, because, I mean, you can look at the food outputs of the United States. They're massive numbers. They're more than enough for the American population, even with as massive as it is. But, again, my two worries are they either do some virtual signal or some underhand move like that, or number two, the constant issues with supply chains. As we were just talking with energy costs and especially gasoline and diesel costs, sure, we might be able to produce the food, but can we transport it? Because that's just as important as being able to produce it. Because if just sitting all in you know select places, all in these places, you know, in the heartland that may be, again, our farmland or, again, wherever, but point being is when you can't get food to point A to point B, when you can't get the sh- store, sh- st- stock, store shelf stocked, that's when crisis breaks out because, again, you could have complete, completely fine in terms of being able to produce it, but if you can't transport it, things are going to go to hell completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's um, that's uh, ultimately the story of uh, the, the modern world is how much uh, mo- mobility plays a role in it. Whether, as I was saying a few episodes back, um, the people living in the post-industrial Western liberal world, uh, one of the things that's nice to live in that world is the ability to travel. And mobility and the sense of individualism itself go hand in hand. Um, when they can't, the, the, the sense of constraint um, just increases. And you can see that, uh, you know, particularly with, with Western people, uh, it's true for everyone, but I say I highlight Western people because they haven't been used to it. Um, it tends to make them batty. All you have to do is take a look at, um, uh, you know, Twitter uh, at the height of the of, of the lockdowns. Uh, y- you know, you had all kinds of people who were were, were just freaking out, and and you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're just not used to this. And so, you know, you're going to have more of that, uh, but by other means. Although I always thought, like, maybe, it, I, I think where things are going, they do want to have that, right? Uh, everybody remembers the 90s after the Soviet Union fell. And it, well, it went into the, I say, I would say the, the first part of the 2000s, the first half. You had all that kind of, um, y- you know, off the beaten track of traveling, right? Going to places that few people ever went to, you know, definitely not tourist uh, destinations. And I just think that... Yeah, like that, a mountain biker in Uzbekistan. Y- y- yes, yes, exactly. So it is, uh, it is interesting that. And I do want to, again, to borrow a phrase from our wonderful press secretary, circle back just to a few of the topics and just, again, sort of, things are not as active as they were, so the show is a bit all over the place just because of the nature of the situation. But in response to the fuel crisis, in response to the rising prices, the narrative from Biden and his talking heads have come out and have given it a very convenient name. This is Pootler's price hike, and (laughs) we are (laughs) making economic sacrifices to support democracy abroad and support freedom fighters in places that are standing up to tyranny, is the narrative that they are selling us. And, again, it's completely incoherent. It's exactly what you'd expect from a Biden administration going forward, but just that phrase stuck with me to the point where, you know, know, Pootler's price hike has to be the title of the episode. It's just... It's it's too good. Look, you have talked me out of several titles I thought were really good, but I don't think there's anything you could say that would actually talk. No, me no, this no. I, I'm not, I'm not going to mess with this. Yeah, um, it's um, lightning in a bottle, so to speak. And also touching on Poland and the situation with Europe again, you have Poland and Hungary in response to the crackdown and the sanctions from the European Union on them, suspend the operation of facilitating the transfer and settling of Ukrainian refugees. Now, at this time, they are still flooding out of the country en masse, the people who can actually get out, the people who um, aren't eligible for conscription, who can get out of the country. 
have poured out in masses. Now, Ukraine has had a extremely high emigration rate ever since the Maidan. We've covered this. From about 2014 onward now, I'm curious what the statistics will look like this year. It's been, give or take, a million of people a year leave either for the West, for Poland, for other places in Eastern Europe, or for Russia itself, was the emigration rate for, again, since the Maidan, since about 2014. And those numbers have only spiked. Ukrainians are now leaving in the millions just in these past few weeks alone. I mean, understandably, the country is at war, as people tend to do when these wars break out. But with that being said, we've discussed often one of the biggest impending crises, and people always talk about demographics, rightfully so, whether that be birth rates, immigration rates, but I think when it comes to a lot of these countries in Eastern Europe in particular, a lot of people ignore the threat of emigration rates. A lot of people ignore the threat of people leaving the country, and in many cases, not looking back, and what that can do demographically to a country. Now, I'm not saying that Russia has its emigration problem under control, but compared to Ukraine, it is a in a much more stable state, and especially after the recent crises, there's not going to be many places abroad that Russians can go, and you could even get the converse effect with some of the sentiments brewing against simply ethnic Russians abroad, that there may be some repatriations. Now, I think things would probably have to get worse for that, and of course there are some headlines about that, and who knows how sensational as they are about uh, Russian businesses or Russian restaurants of diaspora just being attacked or vandalized. Um, unfortunately, churches also being attacked and vandalized uh, simply due to the association with uh, Russian itself. Even uh, even though a lot of them have done the uh, the they've they've done the virtue signal where they've tried to say we support Ukraine, we don't support Putin. A lot of them have gone through that denunciation ritual, which I, I mean, look, even if they do or don't, it's it, it's just. It's painful to watch yeah. just such an absurd ritual go on in the West over something so foreign, honestly, something that's so far away from us. But with that being said, you have that happening, and that could lead to an emigration um, of these diaspora back to Russia, which isn't unheard of, which isn't infeasible either. And maybe the the Russian state will find a way even to incentivize this, because although material conditions are going to stagnate, if not get worse, stagnate at best, I should put it that way, and that's at the very best, uh, it, it could be simply because of ethnic sentiments that they choose to live in a less developed, less economically prosperous country, if it means getting away from the anti-Western sentiments. Because at this point, unless they're going to try to completely scrub any diaspora identity that they have, I don't see any way that... They, I mean, there's even been some, like, where, like, uh, people who are, like, half Ukrainian are still getting this ire for, you know, having identified as Russian at some point in the past. It's just really absurd stuff. And with all that being said, it's, it's going to come to a much more civilizational conflict than we realize, even with populations that are stuck abroad. And there are a few more questions of, of Europe I want to get into with the, their response to this entire crisis and looking down the road with Europe. But ultimately, any goodwill that could have been redeemed between the West and Russia as both civilizations and as individual peoples has been squandered for at least 50 years is just, again, just adopt that figure that there will be this ill will between Russia and Westerners because of this crisis, again, even on the individual level. Now, will that turn into street violence? I doubt it, but who knows? I, again, especially at this point, I doubt it, but again, just, um, negative sentiments towards one another will continue for the far foreseeable future. And, Again, I think it just goes down to the power of civilizational identity, even when you're outside of your traditional homelands. Right, and that that also fits into what because um, I think basically, you know, America has to make a choice between um, 
what was developing would, would have been a multipolar world or a bipolar world, right? So if Russia was allowed to live in a multipolar world, it would have been uh, more difficult for China and it would have been more difficult for the US because it would have made Essentially, if if some kind of a security agreement could have been reached with Europe, um, Europe could have uh, increased industrialization. It could have had this enormous swath of land. China could be a partner, and but also contained. And. Um, but that would have, for, I think for the Americans, they looked at that and they thought, oh no, Russia is going to be too strong. Not necessarily too strong for Europe, but too strong for America. And in a sense, America cannot afford for China to be threatened either as a counterbalance, right? So they are essentially choosing to weaken Europe and it will, that's the cost of weakening Russia in order that a bipolar world is brought into being. Yes, and that those were the uh, calculations that were made, um, I would say, far too late. And also to address that, to go back to Michael Flynn, Trump's first national security advisor, who was ousted after three weeks and is still being dragged through the court systems, did have a more sobering assessment of the future of the American empire in a more multipolar world, and had probably the most reasonable take out of any American strategist I've seen uh, since we started doing the show about how the American empire should approach the rest of the world in the face of a rising Russia, rising China, and even a more independent Europe. But he was, he was spit on for that. He was completely scorned and even treated like a criminal for doing such things, for daring to speak to the Russian ambassador before he even officially took his job. And I think we've discussed this before, a lot of people in the uh, strategic classes, we'll call them a lot of the American strategists, realized that there was quite a bit of truth to what Flynn had to say and are realizing that far too late and trying to implement a very ham-fisted and very, um, let's just say, in a way that completely loses the meaning of what the original plan was in terms of American geostrategy, what it theoretically should have been under Trump. And in getting into what you were saying about right. Europe, like I said, I wanted to talk a bit, a bit more about the forecast for Europe's future that we've been going on, and the news, particularly coming out of Italy, and to a lesser extent France, I'll just start with uh, going back to the to the convent restrictions. France has completely scrapped them, Italy is set to scrap them at the end of the month on March 31st, so 20 days from now, as of the time of recording, so about 19 days by the time you guys watch this, and it looks like that narrative is being laid to rest, and th those were a couple of the the, the true believers, uh, the, the governments of, of France and Italy and, and Germany. I haven't heard any similar stories about Germany. I believe Germany is starting to repeal some of the restrictions, but even these countries that held out for the long haul are now undoing this in face of the new crisis. And you had the Italian Prime Minister Draghi come out and is actually being a very hawkish voice, which contradicts the government which he ousted. Now, I've had my criticisms of uh, Giuseppe Conte, who was the previous prime minister who was ousted around, again, just over a year ago. And, of course, he had the coalition government with Salvini, who was ousted all the way back in fall of 2019. And one of the main drivers of the Five Star Movement was a more pragmatic approach to the world. Now, you already have Italy... Uh, getting further into bed with China economically. And under the five-star government, when the five-star Lega government, but even later on the five-star government under Conte, you had a workable economic relationship with Russia. And now you have Draghi coming out and going completely on board with the energy sanctions especially, saying, we can find alternatives. Now, again, this is a theme all over Europe, but I think it exemplified most within that because he's calling for a more unified European response on the Ukrainian crisis, and that also wants to drastically increase defense spending in face of the Russian threat, and of course come out and saying things like, Putin does not want peace. So, you do see 
I, the reason I bring up Italy in particular, beyond any personal ethnic biases I may have, is I believe it's a microcosm of what happens when you get even just a semi-populistic government overthrown by an establishment government. Because, of course, Draghi was more or less appointed by the European Union now, of course. So they, they'll have their rationalizations about why he's actually in there completely legitimately, blah, blah, blah. But, again, he more or less ousted the former government and was installed in there. But I, I do think it's a very... And you could even look at the United States between Trump and Biden. Even these uh, maybe just populist on the surface, despite not doing anything of real substance figures being replaced by the worst, the worst establishment is almost a punishment for daring to even consider rebelling against the system. Those are the only two I can see for now because in terms of where the, and I suppose you could even say that in some cases the UK with Boris Johnson as compared to after the Brexit vote in the direction the Conservative Party was going up until I would say the lockdowns, not to defend the British Conservative Party too much, but it seemed more sane than it had in several years up until the convict crisis. But beyond the general crisis, I do think with Europe and with the populist movements throughout the Western world in general, you're seeing the price of so-called rebellion in the form of people like Biden, like Draghi, like Boris Johnson. Just as an aside to leave that before I get further into what I want to say about Europe. Right, and you know... Um... Italy is an example, in, in some ways, is kind of like a, a miniature version of Japan in the sense that it's, um, well, it's a, you know, it's a peninsula, it's almost an island. America has uh, its major Mediterranean fleet in there. It's on a short leash, like America can tolerate certain things, but, um, you know, when the next crisis comes along... Uh, they're going to snap into shape, and the, in a way, the crisis itself determines like the kind of the kind of direction that a country or countries will uh, will seek. Uh, yes, much after. similar to w- with what you were saying as as Germany and Japan, these countries that are still fundamentally governed by occupation constitutions. People oftentimes recognize the Japanese occupation constitution less so Germany. Italy seems to be forgotten about, but they are no less yeah. under military occupation. They have troop levels comparable to Germany, and I mean, Japan dwarfs them both because of the rise of China and the current geopolitical situation and the current mm-hmm. assessment, but point being is you make a good point that, and this is a point we've made several times on the show, when it comes to those three countries in particular, those are the three main bases of operation. Those are the three countries that they could tighten the screws on the most that are still on occupation after almost 80 years of peace between these countries, between the United States and these countries. Now, of yeah. course, they have the ability to do this anywhere, um, pretty much anywhere in Europe, um, almost anywhere in Asia, but these three countries in particular are the heart of their operations in their respective parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, Europe is, um, you know, it's a place that has well-established banking connections with, uh, with England and the U.S., and, you know, America's not going to let go of that uh, anytime soon. So, in a way, this, this crisis has been a windfall for the U.S. Because populist politics now, even if they dare to arise, right? Because they've already established that populist politics only enable Russia. And that's part of the reason why they had to adopt that narrative. Was to make which I can say just an aside. I'm almost confident Macron is going to win in a landslide at this point. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, no question. Yeah, absolutely. And and so the crisis itself comes along, but the the lexion that was used the last few years uh, will determine everybody's uh, avowed position, right? Um, it's kind of like that, you know, um, can't remember where I heard this, but, you know, the, the story of, um, you know, Vlad the Impaler, uh, his, his power was so strong and so pervasive that um, he could, he left his, I, I don't know whether it was a brooch or not for, you know, his cape or whatnot, but he left this valuable piece of golden jewelry uh, at a well, and he knew that like nobody would dare take it, 
right? And in the same way, when America creates these shivalifs, let's say it's gay rights, trans rights, child trans rights, whatever, um, you know, uh, Russia, Putin, evil, um, no one will dare touch those words. I mean, we witnessed people challenging those words, and there are states within the United States that uh, uh, still, you know, try to challenge those words. But uh, I honestly don't think that they're going to make a difference. And so when you see, you know, red states like Florida and Texas and whatnot, they know they're obligated that in a time of war that they have to side, uh, you know, with Washington and New York. Yes, there's and certainly they, no secessionist sentiments left they, in the United States. Don't don't get us wrong. Right. Um, they have to, uh, they, they know that, like, they're given a little bit of leeway, um, some court challenges here and there, um, because they will always voice, uh, you, you know, their, uh, their hawkish opinions, right? They, they can never waver on that. And that was, a, 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 that's been a now a long established tradition in America after World War II, because America after World War II became a global power, therefore globalist. And uh, there cannot be a right that has any identity. It can only snap and have an identity of some kind with an external threat. It can never point to an internal threat to it, which beca because of that, it will highlight its ethnic composition, which is mostly white people, right? So it knows that it has to play that game indefinitely. Uh, but it, I would say in the European theater, that doesn't even exist, right? Um, in, in a way, Europe and Canada reflect like the kind of the direction that America wants to get to. Yes, and I've said often, especially of Canada, that Canada is a petri dish. It's a yeah. testing ground for what the social engineers want to do. And also Germany, to a large extent, is as well, seeing as it's an occupied country. And again, when it comes to the testing ground and implementing a lot of these policies, they take root much stronger than the Anglosphere but they can be externally imposed on non-Anglosphere countries. And I actually want to get to something I've been ruminating on for the past few episodes that I haven't really addressed outright, is I will make a distinction for the sake of this argument between American imperialism and American aggression. American aggression can be um, considered raw military action. Think Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan. Actual invasion forces, actual airstrikes, the works. But imperialism is actually a long-term occupation, whether that is with actual troops or not, and an imposition, whether by subversion or by force, whether that be economic or military, of American ideas. Mm -hmm. Whereas you had Afghanistan, of course, they had the token gender studies programs in places like Iraq, Iraq Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, much of our operations in the Middle East and Central Asia we're dealing with Muslim warlords because that's simply the only way you're going to affect any change over there. But Europe, whether going along with it voluntarily or forcefully, and it depends from country to country, place to place, is the most colonized area in the world by yeah. the American ideology, at least. It is Absolutely. the, again, most capitulated part of the world to the American empire. And do you know how you can tell? Seldom do you even get mm -hmm. in an anti-American protest? And we've discussed this before. Yes. The vast majority of anti-Americanism in Europe, and I'm talking the European Union when I say Europe, because, of course, <laughs> exceptions such as a country like Serbia or Russia apply because their anti-Americanism is viewed through a much different lens because of their experience. But it is often viewed that we are better practitioners of the American ideology, of the American civic religion, than even themselves which is the reason why you have places like Finland having Black Lives Matter marches or mm -hmm. uh, pride parades in these traditionally Catholic countries that you never would have thought in a million years would have had them. Because uh, even when it comes to anti-Americanism in Europe, anti-American sentiments have been funneled into proving that they're better Americans than Americans themselves rather than any actual 
uh, reverence for their own country, their own people, their own culture, their own civilizational block, or even their own, just their own raw interests at that rate. The point where it is the most deeply entrenched area. Now, say the American Empire collapsed tomorrow, I don't know how far ingrained it is in the people to the point where how many of them would continue to practice the civic religion in the absence of American influence. I'm sure quite a few, I'm sure millions upon millions of Europeans still would, but arguably it would also lead to something of a national revival. When it comes to these European nationalists, I think many of them have started to learn this lesson, although many of them I do think, especially with this more recent Russia crisis, even especially in Eastern Europe, have been caught up in this fervor, not realizing that one of the big, biggest obstacles to a national revival, a national identity revival, is in particularly uh, what could broadly be called, I would say, Americanism, what it could be called the American ideology, whether that be on the racial politics, the LGBTQ, CIA, or, again, a myriad of any of these issues right here. And I think you had a lot of these populist leaders, say, Le Pen, Salvini, uh, whoever, the, um, the, the right-wing party in Germany, the, um, the a- AFD, they thought they mm-hmm. could have the best of both worlds. They thought they could have a balanced relationship where they still reap the benefits of being part of the American empire, but also get to open the economic doors to Russia, particularly when it comes to energy trade. But they learned very quickly it was one or the other, and they learned very quickly, as we were discussing earlier, what the price of rebellion actually is. The treatment you get for actually even just passively opposing the American empire. And none of these were... Again, for example, you never had Salvini or the ADF call for removal of foreign troops. You never had France or Le Pen... <laughs> they wouldn't dare. Yeah, you never had Le Pen call for a more independent European bloc. So, again, out of all of these populist figures, as useful as they may be, I would say the biggest exception is probably Orban, who, again, yeah. just he is, as we've described, much like Erdogan, a wild card. They still understand the score. They still understand the fact that they are client states of the American Empire, and that while I don't know what their personal sentiments may be, I don't know what the personal sentiments of even their supporters may be, that trying to have a clean break from the American Empire is simply a non-starter. If they want to keep their career, and maybe if you want to be drastic, if they want to keep their livelihoods, if not their lives. Right, and that's the that's the great thing about democracy, right? Uh, if America wants to get rid of a leader. They can fund all kind of all kinds of money uh, into an opposition, and um, they can sanction and ruin a, a, a country because you know your money's in your money, your economy is dependent on their money, on their bill, and everybody will say, "Wow, that happened organically." Um, so, I mean, that's that's the way it works. Uh, and I, I also find now now that we're talking about this, why. There's these sort of discrete reasons why Middle America is so quick to, um, and also conservative Canadians, uh, so quickly identify with Poland and with Hungary because they're stuck in the same position, right? Um, we only ne- we only need you to be jingoistic against Russia and maybe China, uh, but you're going to fall in line uh, otherwise. And they kind of fall for this every time. Like they think their services are really important. Right. Or um, just a little bit of uh, seeing eye to eye with, you know, their their fellow citizens who are left wing in a time like this. You know, they'll be happy to tell you, I told you who the threat was. Right. And of course, you know, unless you're talking to a really paranoid leftist and there's lots of them, they're very well aware that once the crisis passes and the media determines that, um, their services aren't going to be needed anymore, and they're going to have to go back to, um, you know, sucking it up. And it's uh, it's funny how you, you you see the same, you know, they they see each other across the room, as it were, conservative North Americans and, and the Poles, and uh, to a lesser extent, Orban, because in a, in a way, you know, Orban is willing to take bigger risks. I'm not forecasting any success, but he does seem to be signaling that he's willing to take bigger risks than than Poland. But you see with the latest developments, the EU now is going to uh, withhold billions of, uh, upon billions of dollars to both Poland and, and Hungary. And they're going to have to fall in line because, of, of course, if they don't, 
then they're going they're they're going to say well they're just playing into russia's hands why, why are you doing that oh because you want a traditional society oh you mean just like russia and uh, you want to be you want to be poor and traditional bait. just like Klein russia Sinker. like <laughs> Oh, they will, again, because they have developed, and I'm not even saying that they have to be Russophiles, they have to be integrated into the Russian bloc, but they allow their history to cloud their judgment of yes. the present. Where, every time. Uh, where, again, they can't even see the pragmatic value of even just a cooperative relationship with Russia, rather than, or again... Or faking it. Just yeah, fake it. Yeah, just, uh, you know, just throwing a <laughs> smile and, you know, flat... Uh, Moscow every once in a while and, you know, shake Putin's hand just to put enough pressure on the West to get them to back off. Again, Yeah. now, previously Orban had great success in doing this, but I do think it's getting to the point where, uh, with how strained things become between Russia and the American Empire proper, that is going to have less of a return, at least for Hungary. I think Erdogan and the Turkish uh, position is much better because Turkey has much more to offer and is much more valuable asset than Hungary is, a landlocked Central European nation, mm -hmm. versus again, this country that controls the Bosphorus Straits and is right there at the crossroads of civilization, so they have a bit more maneuverability when it comes to that, but point being is you're, you're seeing this happen in real time. As soon as they tell them to fall in line, they most likely will fall in line because that is the paradigm they've been worked into, and e even if it is inadvertent a lot of the times, they simply will fall in line and that is perhaps the greatest strength of the American Empire despite the American Empire being the weakest it's ever been I would say objectively and mm -hmm. there's really with that I don't purport solutions on the show I hardly do but in terms of even just kicking around ideas even just floating things even just talking about hypotheticals I don't even see a hypothetical way out of the thumb of the American Empire. It's too far entrenched where I think for our Europeans out there who value their sovereignty and independence, you're just going to have to uh, weather the storm and wait until the end. And Yeah, sovereignty, independence, and liberty are, they are brand names, and America owns those companies, uh, yeah, so to speak. You, you might, you might lose should, your franchise also... <laughs> uh, if you... Uh, <laughs> Seminal. We should also bring up, uh, I think, um, Israel as well. And, oh, and yes. Because, uh, yes, that's because, actually what I was Because do Bennett next. paid a trip to Putin in, in Moscow to discuss the situation in, in Ukraine. And Haaretz and one other um, uh, Israeli newspaper mentioned that uh, he had told Zelensky to surrender, to accept the, the the Russian terms to which uh, Zelensky said no. Now, since then, uh, Bennett's administration has denied this, but I tend to believe it did happen. This is simply backtracking. Because in a sense, it gives away the game in the Middle East. And that is, the way things are shaping up right now, it's not so good for Israel. Uh, for several reasons. And One... It, despite America basically having a firmer grip on Europe, Europe will economically suffer. And this will, to a degree, affect Israel as well. But that's not really, you know, the main feature. Um, the main feature is now that oil is becoming a scarcity and way more expensive. And of course, you have like in, in Germany where gas is 16-fold um, more expensive Russia, with all the economic loss that it's faced, is making hand over fist money now in this particular market. If it stretches for a year, they'll make profits as if it were two years, but it'll be done in one year. But America is going is courting um, Iran again. And basically, Iran now is in a superior position, right? Iran can pretend, if it wants to, that it's going to develop nuclear missiles. It can give indicators about it, right? Because now, you know, America will say, hey, uh, we need the oil. Uh, we just knocked on Venezuela's door and, you know, we don't know if we're going to get it or not. Uh, but, you know, we, we need the oil. Uh, you know, we can buy it at a better price, uh, so forth and so on. And this puts 
I, I ran in a very comfortable position and Israel in a not very co a comfortable position because Saudi Arabia is also not playing ball with the US. Uh, they've increased output, but they have not gone along with imposing sanctions. And I think Israel as well, having not imposed sanctions on Russia, understands the kind of precarious position that it's in. And it knows it has to play ball um, to some degree, right? Uh, they're, of course, waiting to see who wins, but at the moment, uh, the present scenario is not good for them. Because, of course, if Iran says no, well, you know, Iran has signed an economic agreement with China. They're getting the infrastructure anyways. They're selling, they've already found many ways to sell their oil anyhow, uh, despite the embargoes. So they know they have the upper hand in, in, in making a deal. And just going back to what you were saying, Iran has become something of a kingmaker, ironically enough, because of the cancellation of the JCPOA under the Trump yep. administration. And just getting into the position in the Middle East when it comes to Israel and Bennett, it is funny to watch Bennett fall back into Netanyahu's foreign policy after so profusely trying to step away from it, especially when it came to Syria, when it came to uh, and at least the understanding they have with Russia and Syria. Maybe those threats over the Golan Heights threatening to... Uh, not recognize Israeli sovereignty of the Golan Heights actually worked. Who knows? But point being is the American empire has no reliable partners in the Middle East because Israel, seeing the direction which the wind is blowing, is more conciliatory towards both Russia and China. You have the Saudis and the other Gulf states who have increased cooperation with China over the recent years, as we brought up earlier in the episode in the past few episodes, the slowly but surely decoupling of the dollar and the effective death of the petrodollar on behalf of Saudi Arabia. Now, allegedly, there was some CIA doomsday plan where they overthrow the House of Saud if something like this would ever happen. So I guess we'll see if that's in the card over the next few months. I suppose we could see if there's some sort of regime change attempt in Saudi Arabia over the next few months. Maybe that's what Mohammed bin Salman was, and he played them at their own game. Who knows? But mm, interesting. I, I, that's that's certainly a theory worth speculating on. But point being is that goes once again to Iran. Iran is in a very comfortable position with both China and Russia, and now has this whole new again set of this whole new leverage over the American Empire when it comes to negotiations and opening up those markets and becoming that energy hub, they were beginning to become under the JCPOA before Trump put the ax that. And arguably, the only reliable partner left in the region is Egypt, and even that's questionable because Egypt is, mm. I would say, at least semi-neutral. They have a, a working relationship with all the great powers of the world, as it were, but arguably also one of the most vital because of the control of the canal. And also, we're coming up on the year anniversary of the clogging of the canal, and when it comes to just global trade in general, uh, who knows the significance that Egypt will play going forward, and especially that Iranian oil would have to go through the canal, you know, presumably uh, protected by American assets. So it does, ironically enough, put Iran in this position. And I think one of the other civil wars you will see within the internal affairs of the empire, this one would probably manifests itself along more Republican-Democrat partisan lines as it has before, do we forsake the Zionist lobby for the sake of the greater American empire, for the sake of maintaining Europe under our fist? Because, again, there's a lot of people, especially on the Republican side, where Israel is the first and foremost priority, where there's also a lot of people on the Democratic side saying that Israel is part of the American empire and that they'll play by the rules. They're a cherished part of the American empire, will go of our way to do a lot for them, but they don't get an overriding veto over all of our decisions, whereas the more hardcore Zionists with the American government would disagree with that. And we'll see how strong their faction remains, but you could see this converse sort of situation where a lot of the, I'm not saying it would disappear, but the Zionist lobby's power is diminished to what it was, say, during the Cold War, rather than the post-9-11 era, over the next few weeks, months, and years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, 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 I agree with everything you said. Yes, because I think a lot of people don't realize that the absolute, and we've discussed this before, but the absolute domination of the Zionist lobby within the United States foreign policy was a product of the post-9-11 world. You had several instances where America would snub Israel for its own benefit during the Cold War. Now, they were always generally pro-Israel. They would always come back around and give Israel what it needed, but they wouldn't always give Israel what it wanted. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that because of the situation, because of the collapse of American, effective collapse of American unipolarity, that Israel is going to have to, like the rest of us, learn to live with less while we build back better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it also gives, I think, a much clearer picture, especially in our circles, of what is the relationship, rooted not in theory, not just theory and history, but the actual geography of that region, right? Um, you know, instead of just words, uh, the you know, I, I think it clarifies... A, a reality that's there and um you know all the money that america could could give israel and germany uh obviously israel does not see that as enough because you know their existence depends on on gibbs it's still i, I mean even the the industries and advances that it's made could not have been made without major gibbs right so Certainly, and that's uh, all the main topics I had for today, unless you have something up your sleeve that we forgot. Uh, hmm. No. <laughs> I, I keep think I'll probably, in a half an hour, I'll, I'll probably think of something that I was going to say, I'll remember it, and then it'll be too late. But Such is the, the nature moment, of the show. <laughs> yeah. Now, at the, at the moment, really... Um, I don't think so. I mean, the, the only thing I'll say is, uh, you know, the encirclement in some, some of the cities are, are still going on. Uh, yes, the Russians have taken more hits as a result from what I've seen, but um, the encirclements aren't going away. And now we have Zelensky threatening mass migration unless the West intervenes. Um, ah, from the Erdogan Erdogan playbook. Very yeah, from the Erdogan playbook, and they're saying that they're they're not exporting any more grain unless they get what they want, uh, which is what Russia is doing. So <laughs> maybe Russia and Ukraine are teaming up. Anyways, I, that that's about it for me. Well, that is all I had as well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this slightly shorter edition of the War Report, but. We will see you guys whenever the next crisis breaks out, which will probably be in about, <laughs> about 12 hours. So we'll, we'll probably have to make an episode yeah. of the weekend just knowing the way things are going to go. And we will see you guys whenever that may be. And goodbye. Goodbye and take care.